I'm Brian. Uh, presentation about how we put together electronics and designing stuff and programming stuff. There we go. So, I've been involved with 971 for seven years now, four years as a student, three years as a mentor, um, in various kind of FRC oriented training stuff. I've seen various things about talking about, you know, how to do electrical, how to do software, how to do mechanical stuff, but not a, very many things that focus on how they interact with each other and how decisions you make in various areas affect how hard it is to do things in other areas. Uh, it's always seemed to me like these individual things don't have all that much meaning on their own because if you just have software, you have like a computer or a video game. If you just have electrical, you have pretty blinky lights. And if you just have mechanical, you have a brick. So it kind of, you need to think about how they all work together if you want to do something exciting. Um, 971 tends to push the boundaries of what you can do with all of these things with an FRC robot. Um, some of that is because it's cool. Some of that is because we can. And some of that is because we uh, fail at doing something simpler and then look back on it afterwards and go, well, that was kind of stupid. So just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Important thing to keep in mind, um, 971 tends to set constraints that are almost impossible, but not quite, and then do something ridiculous. So I'm going to start off with some examples of some of the ridiculous things 971 has done. I'm going to kind of refer back to how we made those happen throughout the thing. And we're going to talk about sensors and mechanical and motors. The first ridiculous thing we did in chronological order here is 2014. For those of you who weren't around then, the game piece was these big trackballs. Uh, and we took the obvious approach of uh, you have to hold the game piece. So let's make two independent draws that you have to hold just the right distance apart to hold on to that. So, you see that robot, if you watch it, has that big ball there, see how it just kind of moves and holds onto it? I'll show you again what happens. Not quick there, but um, it just holds onto that. Doing that with two independent jaws uh, is quite tricky, and I think we were the only robot that I saw that did that. That's one ridiculous thing you can do. Next thing was a 2015 robot that had big stack of totes. And if you watch the robot, it takes the big stack of totes and just moves it straight out to the side. But if you look at that robot, it has one set of things that pivot and one set of things that go up and down. But coordinating those together so that you can move it straight horizontally outwards is um, exciting to work through how to make that happen how to design the robot so that it can actually do that, and then doing the software so it does that is, that took a lot of work. Uh, next thing is 2016 robot, which is the uh, unfolding robot. You watch it, goes there, unfolds, shoots, and then folds back up. That whole arm there has two independent pivoty things, and getting those synchronized so it unfolds and doesn't hit itself and then shoots accurately is another thing that takes a lot of work and a lot of uh, exciting design and software to make that so it actually works. And last is this robot over here, which if you watch it shoot, just kind of shoots a stream of balls in a straight line, right? Not a big deal. If you go look at this robot, the way it's made, here's the shooter. It pivots. It's on top of this serializer in the middle here. That also moves. The shooter here has no attachment to the base of the robot. It's In order to stay in place, this thing has to spin at the same speed as this joint down here. And there just has to be constantly spinning at exactly the same speed to keep it pointed in the same direction. Making that work is, again, a lot of coordinated coordination software and a lot of uh, careful mechanical design so that the software can do that. Uh, the most obvious place where you see hardware and software interacting is with sensors. Um, 
those are basically sensors are how the software sees the world. You know, the only way that software can make anything happen is if you have sensors to tell it what's going on now. Um, this presentation, we're going to kind of focus on sensors internal to the robot. I mean, it's not cameras, because sensors internal to the robot, you need those to do anything useful with the camera anyways. And the camera, you have to deal with, you know, what's on the field and stuff, and it's kind of an open problem, kind of tricky to work with. Whereas the ones internal to the robot, you can design them so that you get accurate answers out of those and quickly, and that lets you make the robot go where you want it to fast. Um, the uh, encoders on the drivetrain are, I consider those internal to the robot, even though, you know, you could say, well, if you hit something, the, the drivetrain encoders are how you tell. But you can also look at the drivetrain encoders as telling you where the robot is on the floor, and that's often a more easy to do something with it that way. Uh, like an autonomous, if you're just trying to make the robot drive to a certain place, use those encoders to tell you where you are. Um, in general, FRC sensors, I, there's two kinds. There's binary ones and rotary ones. This next thing we're going to come talk about. Um, binary sensors are either on or off, also known as Boolean. Um, have two states, basically. It means they hook up to a single digital input. And they're pretty easy to work with and stuff. Uh, switches are the most obvious one. Um, mechanical little switches like that one up there. The problem with switches on a robot is when the robot's bouncing around, sometimes that switch will press itself with nothing actually touching it or anything. You drive over a bump in the floor or something. And once that starts happening, it makes it really hard for software to tell what's actually happening because it could be the arm is in a certain position, or it could be you drove over the bump on the ground. So 971 has stopped using mechanical switches uh, since 2012, just because it's so hard to work with them. And you have Hall Effect sensors too. That bottom thing is a picture of a little Hall Effect sensor board that 971 designed with West Coast products, so you can buy those. Uh, Hall Effect sensor is basically, it senses the magnetic field. So if you have one of those little sensors there, and a magnet, and it'll tell you whether the magnet's close to it or not. On this robot over here, there's actually a hollow effect sensor buried underneath here. There's a magnet in this black thing down here. So it uses that. Once the magnet comes by, it can tell where it is. Uh, other basic category of sensor is rotary sensors, where it senses rotation of something, senses where it is. Uh, an absolute sensor means you know where it is as soon as you turn the robot on every time. It tells you, you know, I'm here. An incremental sensor uh, means you only know the position relative to where it was when you started. Which generally, if you're going to use an incremental sensor, then you're going to end up uh, needing to do some kind of zeroing procedure, which we'll talk about in a bit. Because just knowing where you are relative to where you started isn't all that useful. You want to know where the thing is relative to actual reality. Uh, another difference between different kinds of rotational sensors, some of them have a limited range. You know, one or three or five or ten turns is all the range of some sensors. Those kind of sensors can be useful for arms or for shooter hoods or various other kinds of things that only point, you know, they have a finite range. Other things like a shooter wheel or drivetrain motors and stuff, those spin way too far for any Thing that has a limited range, so you kind of need something with an unlimited amount of range, which generally means incremental because an absolute thing has a range that it tells you an absolute position within. Uh, the two actual kinds of sensors that you typically find in FRC are encoders and potentiometers. Encoders, uh, you get good precision out of them, and they don't have a lot of noise, so if the physical robot isn't moving, then the sensor isn't going to be telling the software that it's moving constantly. Uh, so potentiometers have more noise, typically. Uh, encoders also are good for getting quick responses from. Potentiometers, especially after you filter for the noise that you typically have, um, you end up uh, getting a delayed version of what's happening with the robot, which if you want to have software do something quickly, then it's kind of hard if you have 
you know where it was half a second ago. Uh, you'll notice throughout this, I talk about moving things fast. Uh, in general, if you do things uh, less ideally, then you can just do it slower and it'll still work. But a match is two and a half minutes long. And so how long it takes to do, you know, move something from point A to point B, it matters and time starts to add up. So generally, you want to optimize for doing things quickly, you know, as quickly as possible, which means you have to pick sensors that will tell you what's happening quickly. And uh, throughout this, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand, too. Um, next thing that comes up, especially with coders and stuff, is units. Uh, there's various different units you can use to measure stuff. It, it matters a lot what units you use to measure something, because they better match up. But it also really doesn't matter at all what units you use. Because in software, you multiply by a number, and then you have whatever unit you want. So it's, it doesn't, you don't really have to choose it ahead of time or anything. But at the same time, different places, it makes sense to use different units. And you have to make sure everyone's talking about the same units. Otherwise, stuff does not work well. In particular, uh, mechanical stuff, it's often convenient to work in degrees, CAD programs tend to work in degrees. In software, using radians often makes more sense. Those of you who haven't done trig and stuff, uh, radians is another way of measuring rotational angles, which works well for doing trigonometry and for physics calculations. So typically when you're doing software stuff, you'll often be working in radians. But the actual electrical hardware will often work in like encoder ticks or cycles or something. And so Converting between all those is really easy, but if you forget to do it, it does not work. So it's making sure everyone is using the same units for the same thing is important. That zeroing thing I mentioned before. Uh, that's one of the trickier things that a lot, uh, one of the trickier pre-programmed behaviors in a lot of robots that is also like you have to do it first is if you have an incremental encoder or some other kind of sensor and you want to know where the robot or part of the robot actually is relative to the robot, then you have to figure something out. Because you know, knowing where it is relative to where it started, you can try and always start it in the same place every time, but that you tend to forget and starting it in the exact same place is really hard. It'll be in slightly different places. And so then your shooter will be shooting in slightly different places. And that makes it pretty hard to consistently shoot something where you want it to go. Uh, the uh, one of the more basic ways of zeroing is you put one of those kind of binary sensors, like a Hall effect sensor, at some point in the range of motion of the mechanism. Uh, that, and then you know when your robot first turns on, you have it move the mechanism until it sees the sensor trigger, and then it knows where it is. Uh, sometimes it also starts to make sense to get more than one sensor. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, another one you can do is put a potentiometer attached to your same encoder or whatever. Um, that potentiometer, especially if you hold everything still at the beginning, then you can average a bunch of samples from it. And then even if each sample could be, you know, plus or minus a couple inches or whatever, uh, if you average a bunch of them together, then you get an actual single reading without much noise. And you can do that at the beginning when nothing's moving. And that can work pretty well. Uh, the last thing there is what 971 started doing in the last couple of years is you have an encoder with an index pin. Index pin is basically the encoder tells you where it is, you know, as you spin the shaft. And then at one specific spot in the rotation, the index uh, pulse happens. And so you know I am at exactly that point in the rotation. However, it's often useful to uh, gear an encoder up so the encoder spins more than one time through the range of motion. If you do something like that, then um, you can use a potentiometer also where you're, you uh, spin it until you see some index pulse. And then from there, you use the potentiometer to tell you which one of the index pulses it is. And that combination has worked pretty well for 971. Most of that robot is done that way and um, have video in a bit showing what that looks like.
So this is that robot again. You watch it when it first turns on. See how it spins the inside part there and that hood moves up and down? And show it again. Watch it. You see the inside part spinning and the hood's moving there? So on this robot, I was mentioning there's this top part that spins and there's the bottom part that spins. When it first turns on, it doesn't know where either one of those is. So it just spins both of them at the same speed until there's a hall effect sensor up here and there's another hall effect sensor down at the bottom. And so it spins it until it sees both of those trigger and then it knows exactly where everything is and then it can actually point at something. This hood back here moves up and down. So that move up and down too in the video. That one, it just moves it slowly and gently until it runs into one of the limits basically. And then it knows where it is because it can only go so far. But it has index pins on the uh, index pulses on the encoder that it uses to get a precise position, because those limits of the mechanical range of motion they tend to vary kind of a lot as you know things heat up or whatever or between robots, and so you typically want to use something in addition to that to actually tell where you are. A uh, more sophisticated example of zeroing: 2014 robot. So this here is at the beginning of the match. You watch it, it kind of twitches. You know, see both of the, the jaws that twitch back and forth. Looks kind of random, but what it's actually doing there is that robot, uh, in order to get really precise positions on both of those, we have the robot itself move to the sensor at the beginning of the match so we can do it at the same speed every time. And um, we don't want to do that at the beginning of teleop, or at the beginning of autonomous, because there's no time in autonomous. But at the beginning of teleop, you have a second or two while the drivers are getting ready to do something where nobody really cares what the claws are doing. So it does that at the beginning of teleop. Um, that robot also, unlike the hood over here, those, uh, those claws, if you run them into the ends, you will break stuff. So it has some additional sensors at the edges of the range of motion. So when it first starts up, if it's not in the middle there, if it's actually closer to one of the edges, then it will notice where it is before it gets to the end. So that doesn't break stuff. So that robot actually had a total of six hall effect sensors on those two claws for zeroing them. There's one at each end of each, the range of motion for each one, and then there's another one on each of the claws toward the middle, which is right near where it starts, so it has a shorter amount of time to zero at the beginning of the match. Uh, another one on that robot that was particularly exciting is um, 971 builds two robots every year, and no matter what you do, you're going to have the sensors on both robots. They're going to be in slightly different spots. So typically, you come up with some way of measuring some angle or something, lining both robots up in the same place, and then you know tweaking the sensor readings so that you get the same readings on both of them. But even after you do that, they still tend to shoot slightly different distances or whatever. So you end up tweaking the distances a little bit just based on that one's shooting too high relative to the other robot. But with that robot, because there's six Hall Effect sensors and two robots, and each Hall Effect sensor, there's two edges for it. So there's like, what is that? 12, 24 different numbers? Six? Yeah. 24 different numbers to keep track of between the two robots and get adjusted. So we work, that one was always kind of a pain whenever you move one of the sensors and something you had to go sort out which numbers needed to get updated and make sure they got updated so that the robots would still move to the right places. But 971's kind of developed a strategy of um, using the team number that you can read from the control system to determine which robot the code's running on and then use different sets of numbers based on that because trying to like, keep track of downloading different code to different robots it tends to not work out. You always forget to download the wrong code to the wrong robot or whatever. And then, you know, it's shooting a little bit off and you're kind of confused as to why. So we uh, go to create a lot of trouble to avoid that and just make sure that we have the same code on both robots and the code just does the right thing whichever robot it's on. Getting back to kind of the goal of all this stuff is your goal when you're doing hardware and software and stuff is you want the robot to go to the place it needs to quickly. 
and you also want it to go to be the right spot, and you want it to go to the right spot every time. Which doing that is both hardware and software and electrical all kind of working together. Um, you can work around some issues with the hardware. You can kind of work around them with software. You can slow it down, or you can write more sophisticated software. But a you know really basic control loop, you know PID loop, kind of standard starting thing, is it gets you surprisingly far if you have solid mechanical and uh, electrical that actually works well. Uh, the mechanical stuff, it uh, matters a surprising amount in how hard it is to get the software to do what you want. Uh, the two big things that tend to affect how well your control loop functions on the mechanical side are backlash and rigidity. So the backlash is you have two things that are supposed to move together, and in general they do, but one of them will be able to move a little bit without the other one moving at all. So there's you know various components in the system. There's the motor, your sensor, and your end effector. And there you can have backlash between all of those. Um, on this robot, for example, this hood here, if I hold that hood stationary, try and turn that motor, it turns about that much without moving the hood. So it's really little, really low amount of backlash, which means that that sensor knows exactly where that hood is at all times, and if the motor wants to move it just a little bit, it can. Uh, if you have backlash to your motor, then you know your software sees that the thing's a little bit off, so it moves it, and then it goes a little too far, so it wants to come back the other way. Except because there's, there's backlash in there, the motor ends up kind of chattering back and forth and makes a bunch of noise and also makes it impossible to hold something in a specified position for any amount of time. It kind of floats back and forth across it. Um, backlash to the encoder means you don't even know where it is. So you have no possible chance of getting to go where you want because you can't tell where it is. Uh, backlash is particularly hard to compensate for in software just because you don't, if you don't know where something is, you can't control where it is. Uh, the other another thing to keep in mind with backlash is uh, if you have uh, gear reductions, then the ones that are backlash closer to the motor doesn't matter so much because uh, when you gear it down, you know a couple of degrees of backlash on the first shaft closest to the motor, by the time you get out to the end effector, that doesn't actually result in much movement. Whereas like a loose Fit on a hex shaft or something, all the way out at the end, that translates to a fair amount of motion at the end. So you want to pay more attention to the backlash further down in the reductions. Something 971 has done to try and deal with backlash is uh, on some of our mechanisms, uh, we will actually uh, machine a hex shaft after measuring how big the thing it's going into is supposed to be, so we can get it to be exactly the right size and be a tight fit. But also not get stuck. So doing that kind of thing is helpful and usually you only have to do it in one or two places to get most of the effect of it. Uh, yeah. Oh, the other one is uh, tightening, tensioning chains and belts and things. Uh, if you don't tension them, then you know one of the sprockets can move one end without the other one moving at all. So you typically want to make sure that you design your mechanical so that it's easy to tension things and keep track of how how tight things are and make sure you tighten them when they're loose. Uh, next thing is uh, rigidity. Is when things bend, you know, they're floppy, it's kind of hard to make them go to the position where you want them to go. Uh, in particular, if you try and make them move quickly, then if it's too floppy, the software just ends up wiggling one end back and forth, the other end isn't moving at all. But you just kind of things shake around and you can't you can't control them to go where you want and you just end up wasting a bunch of energy wiggling them back and forth. Um, rigidity is a often overlooked thing when doing mechanical design on stuff. Uh, Materials that are stronger tend to also be stiffer, but you know, different kinds of metals and things have different stiffnesses and strengths. 
So when you're looking at choice of material or choice of how to design something, in addition to looking at will it be strong enough, it's also helpful to think about will it be rigid enough. Uh, on that robot that unfolded, the 2016 one, uh, when we first designed that, it was actually not rigid enough, and so we had to slow it down to make it open without like breaking itself. Um, so we, it was too slow, so we actually ended up uh, taking the chain that was driving the thing and making it a bigger chain so it's stiffer. Uh, so it's stiffness, is, rigidity is an important thing to think about when you're designing stuff, and it's also easy to overlook the one piece in the middle of something that turns out to be the floppiest part and cause so much problems. Other thing is gear ratios. Uh, when you have a motor and you have it attached to something, you have gears in between them. Because your typical motor is spinning way faster than whatever you want to hook up to it. So you have to choose how fast you want the motor and the end thing to spin relative to each other. Uh, when you're Choosing gear ratios, uh, you have to take into account how much power it takes to hold something in place. Because if you're trying to hold something in place for a whole match and you're putting a bunch of power through the motor to do that, the motor's going to get hot and the motor's going to break. And that does not go well. Um, in particular, uh, as an example, uh, in the 2016 robot, we, uh, when we chose the gear ratios, we looked at how fast the thing would accelerate and how fast it could move, but we didn't really uh, think about how much force it was going to take to hold it in place. So it, uh, the motors actually got really hot doing that, and we had to put like, fans on the motors to get them to not burn out during matches. So that one almost required redesigning it to change the gear ratio because it really was not good. So thinking about how much power it takes to hold something in place is important. It does matter. Uh, the other one is uh, when you have extra force, it means you can accelerate. When more force, it means you can accelerate stuff faster. So sometimes when people are thinking of their G ratios, they just look at how fast it's going to go and don't think about how fast it's going to accelerate. If you have a high top speed but you never get there, it doesn't really help you. And also, having a higher top speed, though, it doesn't mean you have to move it that fast because you can always slow it down in software later. So, you know, when you're designing stuff, thinking about like, how the software is going to work with it and what you could just fix in the software later versus what you should spend time and effort on trying to fix in mechanical earlier is an important thing to keep in mind. The other one to think about with gear stages, or gearing, is uh, if you have more gear stages, it tends to give you more backlash because each set of gears that meshes has an opportunity for them to not be quite tight so they can wiggle a little bit. Also, hex gears on hex shafts tend to have backlash. So it's usually important to keep that in mind and consider like shims or making custom shafts or something for the last stage or two. The other one is friction created by more stages of gears. Friction makes it harder for software to deal with, to control stuff. Um, because if you have something sticky, then software wants to move it just a little bit to get it in the right position, but it can't because it's applying just a little bit of power and it's not moving at all, then it applies a little more, a little more, and eventually it moves, but then it moves a whole bunch of overshoots. So you typically want to try and minimize friction. Um, another thing with gears is there's various kinds of gears, you know, spur gears and worm gears and bell gears. 971 only uses uh, spur gears because for most FRC stuff, that works fine. and other kinds of gears tend to have uh, worse trade-offs between uh, backlash and friction. In general, if you mash two things together, you have less backlash, but then you have more friction. And with spur, uh, with bevel gears and worm gears, that problem gets worse than with spur gears a lot of the time. Um, the other one is when, in particular with the angle gears, but with spur gears too, uh, what you mount the gears to, if it flexes, then that basically creates backlash. So the stiffness of what you mount the gears to, and you know your bearings and stuff, backlash in those uh, 
it also affects backlash in the overall system. Mm -hmm. uh, question. Generally, what you do is you take something like, say, this thing here. If you want to come on up here, I can show you. So you take it, you hold one part stationary, and you hold the motor stationary, and then you see how much it moves. So if you hold, you see this here, I'm holding the motor, you know, I'm holding the thing, that, that wiggles a little bit, that's the backlash there, because yeah. the motor is not spinning. Which, on this particular one, it's yeah, there's a bit of backlash in there, but it's not that bad. So you just kind of like test it, see, like there's no quantitative ways. You could measure, you know, the degrees this thing moves with some amount of backlash or something, and you can calculate, you know, if this is three thousandths of an inch bigger or whatever. But it's kind of hard to calculate that from CAD or whatever because it's all about the tolerances and typically. If you had, if you could do tolerances tight enough, you just have no backlash. Yeah. So. It's kind of you think about how precisely do we need to control the position of this, and then try and make sure the backlash will be below that, so you can actually do that. Motor controllers. Uh, motor controllers. There are differences between different motor controllers. Uh, it's FRC, now there's quite a variety of choices in motor controllers. Some of them have more like finer graduations between the amounts of power you can apply than others. Uh, particularly the old Victors that probably before most of you guys started, uh, those were particularly bad about that, where they had like not that many different levels of power you could apply. Uh, most of the newer ones are fine, I think. Although 971 pretty much just uses the Victor's compellents, which I know are fine. Um, it's also different motors are different. Um, some motors are a lot easier to make fine movements with than others. Uh, in particular, some motors have this uh, cogging thing where they kind of the motor wants to be in some positions more than others. That comes from the way the magnets and the steel inside the motor is arranged. Uh, but some motors are a lot worse than others at that. And when you have cogging like that, it makes it hard for software to move stuff slowly. Because the motor kind of jumps between positions. And the software can't really deal with that. So it makes noise and it also makes you know s slow and small motions hard to do. The other thing with motor controllers is a lot of motor controllers have these coast and brake mode options. Uh, where you know coast mode is when you apply zero power, the motor kind of moves freely. Brake mode is where it uh, has more resistance on it. Brake mode is actually really annoying for trying to do anything with software, because what brake mode means is the software wants to, you know tries to apply a little bit of force on the motor, and then the software wants to apply no force. But instead of no force, it gets force in the other direction trying to stop it. So you want to avoid brake mode, and if you want to hold something in position. It tends to work a lot better to just have the software do it. Um, the other one is the uh, switching frequency of motor controllers. Is uh, It is different between different motor controllers. Uh, a motor controller is a digital device, so if you ask for half power, it can't actually do that. It's just turn on and off really fast. And some of them switch on and off faster than others. And the ones that switch more slowly um, they have some effects in the motor where you ask for 10% power, then you ask for 20% power. 20% power will be like three times 10% power. But then the difference between 40 and 80 is only one and a half x as much power. And software, dealing with that in software is pretty annoying because it's when the software asks for twice as much, you really want twice as much. So picking motor controllers that switch faster and have more fine control is important for uh, making stuff move well. Kind of ending summary, um, thinking about what's going to work well for all the different subsystems of the robot throughout the design process is important. Uh, there's a lot of situations where if you think about something earlier, it's easy, but if you wait until the end, it's hard. Particularly mounting sensors works like that a lot. Where if you figure out where you're going to mount the sensors early and design in space for them and a place for them to mount, 
it's usually not that hard. But if you're trying to wait until the end, then you realize, oh, if I could have made that just half an inch over that way, then it would have been easy to put a sensor here, but now there's no space. Also, thinking about you know the overall workflow of stuff, how um, how software is going to work with the hardware, how the software is going to figure out where things are at the beginning of the match and everything. That's thinking through that early in the design process instead of late tends to lead to better results. Also, making everything fit does matter. You know, backlash and rigidity stuff, it, it makes a pretty big difference to how fast you can make things work. And choosing the right sensors, also important. Uh, there's definitely choices there, and there's you know, trade-offs and cost and size and all that kind of stuff. Um, sensors are one of those things that it kind of makes sense to uh, use some of your budget to get nice sensors because you can reuse sensors from robot to robot usually, and also bad sensors tend to overwhelm most other things and make it like, if you have bad sensors, it doesn't matter what you do with the rest of the stuff, you're not going to get the robot to do what you want in the end. And the last kind of concluding remark there, think about how simple you can make it early in the design process. 971 is not terribly good at that. Um, we often look back at the end of the season and go, well, that would have been a way better idea. But uh, it is also kind of fun sometimes to do something crazy. So there's that to consider. Because why are you doing robotics if you're not having fun? And yeah, that's about all the stuff I got. Does anybody on any questions? question was about hall effect sensors. You have two edges of a hall effect sensor, or a magnet and a hall effect sensor. So as you move a magnet by the hall effect sensor, you see there's no magnet, now there's a magnet, and then you keep going and there'll be no magnet again. Uh, when we're dealing with stuff, we typically, we have an encoder so we know which way something's spinning. And when you combine which way something is spinning with whether it's a rising edge or a leading, or a falling edge, uh, then you can tell which edge of the magnet you're at and figure out where you actually are. Yeah? Well, Brian, I have a question. So sometimes you have a magnet like your 2014 world up where you're holding things up against gravity. And you're using, like, you got rid of brake mode, you're using screw gears. Do you just use motors to hold up? Do you ever do any counterbalancing or mechanical brakes of any kind? Or so as far as holding things up against gravity, we exclusively use motors to do that. Because uh, generally on an FRC robot, you can design it so that you are, you're putting a small enough amount of power through the motor to hold things up so that it doesn't overheat through the match. Uh, the one place where we have used is kind of separate thing to hold a mechanism is a 2014 shooter, which um, it pulled back this uh, plunger against some really big springs and then um, it held it there and then the same mechanism that pulled it back moved to a varying position to control how much power the uh, shooting it would have and to hold that in position against the impact of uh, firing it, we had a bicycle disc brake just because the uh, shock loading doesn't go so well through gears and stuff. But beyond that, we pretty much just use motors to hold things up against gravity and you know, try and think through how much heat that's going to generate and make sure it's acceptable, although it doesn't always work out 100%. And current draw. Yeah. So um, if you're thinking about heat in a motor, uh, the torque a motor generates is proportional to how much current it's drawing and that's also proportional to how much heat it makes. So in general, if you ask for twice as much force out of the motor, it's going to make twice as much heat. And there's there's numbers you can do using you know, motor curves and data sheets and stuff to figure out how much heat it's going to make holding up some amount of weight. And then you usually want a pretty good factor of safety, and then you can figure out how low you need to gear the mechanism. So do you guys actually calculate yeah. 
during the design process, that is something we take into account is how much current is it going to draw holding that position, and how much you know how much heat can we realistically get out of the motor and make sure those work out. Any other questions or anything? Question is about linearity with the sensors and um, potentiometers tend to have linearity problems. For those of you who don't know, uh, linearity is the uh, name of that thing I was talking about earlier, where uh, you want twice as much to actually be twice as much, and not one and sometimes one and a half times as much, and sometimes three times as much. Uh, so linearity for a sensor means that you know halfway through the range of motion is halfway through the readings on the sensor. And potentiometers uh, tend to be not the greatest with that because potentiometer is giving you an actual reading, you know, it's kind of a continuous reading that it's giving you. Um, encoders, on the other hand, tend to be very good about linearity, which is another reason to use encoders for actual uh, fine positioning of things. Because an encoder just has an optical uh, mechanical pattern on a disk and some light sensors, basically, which it uh, uses to count. And so you know, halfway through a rotation on the encoder is going to be half the number of counts, pretty much every time. Got another one. So in 2014, when we brought up Mammoth, uh, the claws we were working on them, and uh, we couldn't control it at all. What was that all about? How did we fix it? Remember that? What you said this. You said this. The, the readings I'm getting are garbage. Oh yeah, that one. Um. So he was a student that sorts us out. A couple hours before we're trying to bag the robot, and we're uh, looking at this, and the encoder readings are making no sense. Like you'll move one direction, and they'll move, and then you move back the other direction, and the, the encoder reading doesn't change at all. Or you move it slowly, and it does something, and you move it quickly, and nothing at all happens. So after a whole bunch of trying to figure out this is a software problem, where if the sensors weren't working, you know, try another sensor, try all kinds of things. You, know, you plug a sensor straight into the Robo Rio and it works, but then you try and plug in a sensor up at the top and it doesn't. We uh, got an oscilloscope and looked at what the signals looked like, and it turns out um, the wiring was causing the two signals from the encoder. So the encoder works it as two digital signals that go on and off, and the uh, wires were really long and had those signals right next to each other. So when one of them would change, it would make the other one kind of wiggle and it wiggled enough that the uh, Robo Rio was getting confused and losing track of what was going on. So we fixed that by uh, getting better cables. That was exciting to figure out what was going on. What kind of cables do we use there? We have twist cables. So if you get a cable, um, cable is basically a thing with multiple wires in it. Our wire is, you know, single conductor. Um, if you have a cable with multiple conductors in it, uh, you can have them, you know, like a ribbon cable, you know, just a bunch of cables right next to each other, like those kind of standard cables that we use a bunch in FRC. These, uh, these kind of ones with the white and red and black, um, those have all the conductors next to each other, so those tend to be kind of prone to having signals in one of those conductors get coupled over into another one. Uh, for most of our sensor runs now to encoders and stuff, we get cables with twisted conductors. So they'll be twisted in pairs. You know, there'll be one pair that'll have ground in one signal, and another pair that'll have power in the other signal. And that means the two signals don't uh, affect each other too much, and the ground and power don't have any information flowing through them. There's no edges, so those won't mess up the signals either. That's another good thing to think about when you're looking to buy parts and putting parts on a robot is making sure that the wires are well managed and far apart from each other. Because motor wires will also cause a problem with that. Whereas when you have a motor turning on and off, I mentioned how the uh, motor controller can't actually do half power, it just switches on and off really fast. Um, if you have that next to a sensor wire, then you can see switching on and off really fast in the sensor reading. And that does not do it any good. In addition to having the you know, twisted cables and stuff, you have shielded cables, which basically is a big uh, piece of foil around the twisted pairs. 
And that also helps to reduce how much noise gets into the signals. So some of the encoders have ball bearings on and some don't. There's a cost premium. Is it worth it? There's a bunch of different choices when you're buying sensors. Um, some of them will be, you know, one of the more common choices is you can get encoders with a ball bearing on it or without. Ones without ball bearing tend to be designed for slower moving. And if you take those and spin them really fast, they get hot eventually fail. So you want to look at how fast you need something to spin and, you know, how much force you can put on it and using that and you know also size constraints and all those kind of things you factor into choosing which sensor you makes most makes most sense for an application. Okay. But yeah, for the most part 971 and, and this year use 775 pros and sims. Because the sims are good for you can put a lot of power through them for a sustained period of time and they heat up, but they're uh, they weigh enough that it takes long enough to heat up that you can do that for most of a match and not really have a problem. Whereas the 775 Pros, they don't have all that weight, which makes them pretty convenient when you want smaller, lighter motors. But they're also very powerful, so you can do, you know, you can use them to move large things. Anybody else? So Getting back to your last slide, there was a bullet item about making things as simple as possible. Um, the first time I ever saw that robot that unfolded the arm, my mouth just fell open. Because A, I thought it was incredibly cool looking, and B, I wonder it could possibly be worth it to make it back open. What's your bottom line? Uh, we failed to come up with a better answer, so that's what we did. Uh, that doesn't make it a particularly good idea, but it was pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah, we. Well, we wanted to shoot high, right? We yeah. Wanted a high shooter. We. A lot of people had high shooters. That didn't fold up on that. We we placed a bunch of constraints on the design and came up with something that we could barely do that met all the constraints, and then did it without stopping to think if maybe dropping one of those constraints would be a good idea. The constraints were, you know, shoot from up high and go under the low bar and do it quickly. And all of those together don't leave you a lot of options. So that's that's kind of how that robot came about. I mean, this robot here, we uh, had an idea for how to get balls in a line and shooting them and um, didn't stop to think exactly whether maybe not making the middle part spin would have been simpler and done almost as well. Uh, and then we also, uh, we started out with this top part attached to this post back here. That's why it's here. It's not just a big post there, just amount of radio. Um, originally it was attached there and powered off of that, but then balls were getting stuck on that. So we uh, decided to go with the counter rotating turret thing that, um, again, it was kind of a we figured we could make it work, but just barely. And so we kind of went for it. But that might not have been the best idea if we had seen it coming from the start. We probably would have done something simpler. Even if you could make something simpler, but it would be more fun. I mean, there is something to be said for doing cool things. But make sure you come into it knowing that. And don't surprise yourself. And I think we're about done with time. Yeah.